initiatives. This is an hour 45 minutes. Um, I now recognize uh, myself for five minutes to make an opening statement. Uh, but before I, I do, um, let, me, uh, let me note I will then go to uh, Congressman Pence uh, as the ranking member. Uh, and in subsequent hearings, uh, it would be our hope that just he and myself would make opening statements. Um, but on this uh, initial uh, hearing, uh, any member of the panel that wishes uh, to make an opening statement is most welcome. Uh, I'd be remiss not to begin by thanking uh, the chair of the House Rules Committee, Louise Slaughter, uh, and the ranking member, David Dreyer, uh, for making their hearing room available uh, to the select committee. Uh, I also want to welcome everyone to this initial meeting of the select committee that has been mandated by the House to review roll call number 814. Uh, I would note that none of the members uh, sought this particular assignment. But each of us appreciates the role and the significance of the House in our unique constitutional order and recognize that the integrity of the system by which we cast our votes on the House floor is essential to the confidence that the American people have in this institution aptly described as the People's House. We are all institutionalists. Each of my colleagues has served this House well. Each of them is admired and respected on both sides of the aisle and enjoy a reputation that reflects the finest traditions of this institution. I am, genuinely, I am genuinely honored to serve with them. And I do believe, I'm not naive, but this, this augurs well for a successful effort. But I have no reservations about the motives and bona fides of these members. And I'm confident that, at a minimum, we'll be able to demonstrate a degree of civility and comedy that reflects well on the House of Representatives and is expected by the American people. Today, we will adopt a set of rules and an interim report that will yield order, efficiency, and ensure bipartisanship, cooperation, and most importantly, transparency. This would not have been possible without the assistance of the Congressional Research Service. I would note that as the committee takes stock of uh, resource issues, the ranking member and myself requested the assistance of CRS. And we have been indeed fortunate to have access to Judy Snyder and Mike Kempel, whose expertise is truly remarkable. They have been a superb resource uh, as we get underway, and we are in their debt. Thank you, Judy, and thank you, Mike. With that, let me yield to the ranking member, the gentleman from Indiana, Mike Pence. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, at this first formal meeting of the uh, Select Committee to investigate the voting irregularities of August 2nd, 2007, uh, let me say I'm, I'm humbled to serve as uh, the ranking member. Um, I'll seek to confirm the confidence placed in me by approaching this task um, with a firm commitment to fairness and the facts. I'm especially grateful to serve with my vice ranking member, Congressman Steve Lotzeret of Ohio, and Congressman Kenny Holshaw, whose years of experience exceed mine uh, and whose reputations uh, for integrity 
will, as the chairman noted, greatly enhance our ability to move forward. Allow me, Mr. Chairman, to echo uh, the esteem which you express for all the members of this committee. Based on the caliber of the members appointed by the Democrat majority, including the chairman, uh, and given in evidence of our preliminary and informal discussions prior to this hearing, uh, I am confident we will be able to proceed with this inquiry in a bipartisan manner that puts the interest of the American people over partisan politics. I'm especially grateful for uh, the chairman's uh, cooperation uh, in uh, in the uh, securing of resources for this committee and very much look forward to continuing to work with, with you and all of the members of this committee to ensure that we have the resources necessary to conduct this, manner, this uh, investigation in a manner uh, befitting the seriousness of the issue. The Constitution of the United States enshrines the right of every member of the House of Representatives to vote on the floor of Congress on behalf of the people they were elected. Sir, this select committee has been charged with a solemn duty to investigate voting irregularities on August 2, 2007. The integrity of the House of Representatives is completely dependent on the integrity of the vote that takes place on the floor of Congress. Every American is entitled to have a voice in the People's House and to know that their representatives vote counts. As the ancients knew, honesty in measurement is central to the administration of justice. In the book of Leviticus that I read just this morning, it provided, quote, do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weight. The events of August 2, 2007, where confusion and anger reigned on the House floor represented a serious breakdown in the voting system of this institution. And the integrity of the means of measurement were called into question. That night, the Republican minority voted to deny taxpayer-funded benefits to illegal immigrants in roll call vote number 814. According to the voting machine in the minority, the Republican motion to recommit prevailed. According to the man holding the gavel in the majority, the Democrat majority prevailed. This conflict between parties, man, and machine must be thoroughly investigated. This select committee must follow the facts and let the chips fall where they may. Whether they lead to findings of an abuse of authority to benefit illegal immigrants, or to glaring holes in the rules of the House, or to other determinations, we will expose the truth of what happened and ensure the voting franchise of every member of Congress is protected. And let me say as I close, Mr. Chairman, we will approach this task in a fair, thorough, and solemn manner. For as the scholar Norm Ornstein wrote recently, quote, the dynamic here between the parties is not just game playing, it is serious business. The House is fragile enough that we could end up with truly nasty and counterproductive behavior deeply damaging to the country and the long-term operation of the Congress." Close quote. I look forward to working with my colleagues in both parties on this committee. I appreciate the spirit of cooperation and comity that has characterized discussions to date. Members of the minority commit today to continue in this spirit to ensure that the members, officers of the House, or staff who were responsible for this incident be held to account, and to develop recommendations to ensure that this never happens again. We owe the American people and the People's House nothing less. Thank you, Mr. Pence. And let me turn to uh, the vice chair of the select committee, the distinguished gentleman from Alabama, Arthur Davis, and see whether he uh, wishes to make any opening remarks. Mr. Chairman, thank you for recognizing me. I will be extremely brief because I know that we're here to begin this process today and not to orate, but let me just say a couple of things by way of perspective. First one is this. Um, many of the American people do not realize how exclusive this institution of the House of Representatives has been since 1789. 
as of this day, September 27, 2007, less than 13,000 American citizens have ever served in this place. The smallest county in my congressional district has the same number of people. Many of the counties that many of us represent have substantially greater numbers of people. This is one of the smallest, most exclusive fraternities and sororities, if you will, in the world. And we're mindful of that, Mr. Chairman. We're also mindful of this solemn charge we've been given by our colleagues. Our colleagues voted overwhelmingly in a bipartisan manner to charge a group of members to conduct a searching inquiry of the moment on August 2, 2007, when the routine turned unusual, when a process that we have come to take for granted experienced some unexpected bumps and turns. All six of us take this responsibility enormously seriously, and I echo what the chairman and ranking member have said. We're honored. Not one of us sought out this assignment. This is the fourth committee for some of us. But we have all agreed to serve, if I can be so bold, I think is to echo what I think all of us are thinking. We've all agreed to serve because whenever the House is in question, whenever its practices are in question, members have a stake in doing all that we can to ensure and preserve its integrity. And that's the spirit that I'm sure will motivate us. Now you'll back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. And now I would go to the, the vice or ranking member uh, of the select committee, the distinguished gentleman from Ohio who uh, uh, during the Republican uh, era uh, as the majority party uh, distinguished himself as on many occasions as a presiding member and someone whom uh, I look forward to uh, working with uh, because of his special expertise uh, and his exceptional talent, Mr. La Tourette of Ohio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, was getting ready for this hearing last night, and I believe I'm the oldest serving member. Uh, been in the House the longest uh, on this. Decision. You might be yeah. the oldest member. Actually. Well, and I, but I was, I was going to say I don't think I am the oldest member. I, uh, but but uh, this is my uh, my seventh term. I'm a member of the historic Republican class of, of the 104th Congress. And I had never served in the legislature. I, I was a prosecuting attorney by nature. And so a lot of things that, that I saw in 1995 were, were foreign to me. I'd never encountered them. And, I remember going to Republican conference meetings, and some of my new Republican friends said, 40 years we've been in the wilderness, and now it's payback time. We're going we're gonna to treat the Democrats the way that they treated us for 40 years. And then, as I was here a little bit longer, and we slogged through the contract with America, and about six months later, I became friendly with a number of the people on the Democratic side. And they would say to me, we were bad, but we were never this bad. And uh, I took that to heart. And then we sort of fast forward 12 years, uh, and because of some uh, miscues on our part. Uh, the majority has now shifted again. Uh, the 110th Congress is an historic Congress in that we have the, the first woman Speaker of the House in the history of the country. And I think we're all honored to uh, serve in this country. I know from the Republican perspective, it's nice we made history. Now let's get back to the way it was for 12 <laughs> years. But uh, I hear the same things. Uh, I hear uh, uh, some of my Democratic friends say, you abused us for 12 years, and now it's payback time. Uh, and I hear some of my Republican friends say, uh, we were bad, but we were never this bad. Uh, which I, I guess brings us uh, to this committee and, and why I think while perhaps the world isn't watching, I hope that our colleagues that aren't on the committee are watching. A number of us at our first get together said that this committee, in discharging its responsibility fully and fairly, has the opportunity to bring the temperature down uh, here on the House side. And I hope that that's, uh, that's where we go. And I, I would tell you that there are a number of steps that that we're going to have to take, uh, and a number of steps that we've already taken uh, that, that give me hope. And I just want to outline those and, and tell our colleagues that, that aren't here today why they should be encouraged by what we're about to embark on. There are a number of things that didn't have to happen. We didn't even have to be in this room. When uh, Minority Leader Boehner made the uh, motion uh, to uh, create the Select Committee, the Majority Leader, Mr. Hoyer, could have moved to table it. Uh, and it would have been a partisan vote, and there never would have been a Select Committee. The majority chose not to do that. The majority leader said that he uh, recognized that there were some difficulties with roll call 814, and he uh, didn't stand in the way uh, of the uh, setting up this committee. I think that's an important thing to recognize and give credit to the majority for doing. 
The second thing, as you and other members have talked about, is that each, each side could have picked really partisan people uh, to be on the select committee. And uh, Mr. Pence uh, quoted Mr. Ornstein's article. He predicted that this would be a 3-3 tie, uh, that uh, we're just going to be partisans, we'll pretend to be fair, but we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, and I don't think that that's the case. And I think the leadership of both parties deserves credit for appointing people that, at least to my understanding, will attempt to be fair. And then lastly, <clears throat> after our last uh, get-together, I was tasked to uh, meet with Congressman Davis to talk about things like schedule and how we're going to move forward. And I found nothing but cooperation. Uh, I found nothing but a willingness to, to work together. Uh, and I think that we're off to a good, uh, a good first few steps, and I look forward to it continuing. And I, it's an honor to serve with you, men and women, and I look forward to it, and I thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, and let me go to my right and recognize the, uh, the gentle lady from South Dakota, Stephanie Persephson. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, would echo um, uh, the comments previously made in terms of how I deem this to be an honor to serve uh, with very distinguished and respected colleagues uh, to uh, look into the circumstances surrounding a particular roll call vote but also the broader charge of making recommendations uh, that may be necessary uh, to ensure uh, that we can avoid such circumstances in the future. And to do this historically, to understand uh, the practices, the traditions of the institution, of what's happened on the House floor in the past, how we conduct our work, how we work with one another, and how much we rely on those who are on the House floor to help us as we cast our votes uh, on behalf of our constituents. And uh, as was commented upon as well, we have man, uh, machine, and parties and competing uh, circumstances, uh, again, with this vote, but taking the broader view, laying the foundation, following the facts, and making recommendations that are good for the institution, that are fair to all of our colleagues, and certainly making sure that the commitment to our constituents and the integrity of the votes that we cast on behalf um, is uh, ensured for this Congress and Congresses to come. And the seriousness with which we all undertake these responsibilities on the Select Committee can't be overstated uh, in terms of where the accountability will reside as we look into a particular roll call vote, uh, but again, providing the clarity that may be necessary going forward and I agree with uh, my colleagues that the comedy and cooperation that has already marked our work, that we anticipate will continue to mark our work, uh, will uh, impact the broader environment in which we work here in the House of Representatives. Uh, so thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Pence, uh, for what we've already accomplished uh, in a relatively short period of time and working with all of us to ensure that the process going forward with the Select Committee is one that's transparent, that's fair, and that's focused on the betterment of the institution. Uh, uh, thank you, Congresswoman. And let me now go to uh, uh, the gentleman uh, from Missouri, with whom I have uh, worked in the past. The state uh, has drawn us together again uh, on a difficult task, but one uh, that I know um, he will conduct himself as he always does in a way of, uh, in a manner that uh, bespeaks well of his personal integrity and his independence and his fairness, and that's Kenny Helson. Kenny. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your courtesies. Uh, thank you for your friendship. I appreciate that. Uh, it, it's humbling to be here uh, with the caliber and integrity of the members that are here. Uh, it's an unfortunate matter that such an event occurred in August that necessitates this select committee, but it's fortunate, not just for the institution, but it's fortunate for the American people that the caliber of those that are here that sharing the dais with me uh, that I'm privileged to serve with uh, will uh, get to the bottom of this matter. Uh, Mr. Delahunt, my friend, uh, references the other occasion with which unusual circumstances brought us uh, together. Uh, the last time I served in this type of investigatory capacity, it was, uh, again, centering on a vote on the House floor, not voting irregularities, but uh, the Medicare Modernization Act in November of 2003, and there were some uh, allegations made by certain members, and as a result, being on the Ethics Committee, an investigative subcommittee was impaneled. I was the chairman of that subcommittee, and Mr. Delahunt uh, was uh, 
fortunate enough to also uh, share time. And I, as I recall, I referenced something you said, Mr. Latourette, about some of the naysayers out there. I recall before that investigative subcommittee uh, that there were those who predicted doom and gloom, predicted gridlock, uh, predicted that uh, the ethics process could never hold our peers accountable. Uh, in that instance, we, it was necessary, the House rules required us to toil in confidentiality, and so the public could not see what we were doing in that instance. Uh, but I believe the process and the eventual report uh, that admonished the then majority leader uh, proved those pessimists wrong. Uh, I believe in this instance uh, that uh, we will go where the facts will take us, uh, we will judge those facts accordingly and take whatever appropriate actions are deemed necessary. I, and I have no qualms at all, uh, certainly by the, about the chairman and about his dedication to that goal. I think, as everyone has said, the integrity of the institutions at stake, uh, and we will, I believe, uh, perform our uh, service uh, in a manner that will elevate the integrity. And I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back to you. Uh, thank you, Kenny. Um, the first uh, agenda item is the adoption of the Select Committee's rules. And uh, before I recognize the gentleman from Alabama, let me uh, thank the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Davis, and the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. La Tourette, uh, for their work um, during the course of uh, the past week, um, they have uh, come together, and I think this was acknowledged uh, by Steve La Tourette, and um, worked together in a way that uh, I think befits what we've all been saying in terms of a, a, a common effort uh, to work in a way that's bipartisan. And with that, let me recognize the gentleman from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll ask the staff to publish the document that we will submit for consideration labeled Rules of the Select Committee to investigate the August 2nd, 2007 roll call vote 814. And uh, let me thank my friend from Ohio, Mr. LaTourette. Both of us were charged with coming up with rules for the Select Committee. And we both believe that there was no need to reinvent the wheel. We believe that given our small size and our charge to be expeditious, there were some minor tweaks that we needed to make to help us do our business in a more orderly fashion but we arrived at overwhelming consensus as to how we should do this. Uh, the documents being put in front of the members and the staff today is very straightforward. In fact, what we've done to translate to plain English is to adopt the rules of the normally governed regular committees of the House of Representatives with three exceptions. I will outline them. Uh, every committee is charged with setting a regular meeting day. Uh, Clause number one states that the regular meeting day for this committee shall be the first Thursday of each month at 9 a.m. As all who are here are very well aware, the chair has the discretion, the first ranking member, to add to that, uh, to patch additional meetings and help us finish our business in the next several months. But the regular meeting time that we will establish will be 9 a.m. on Thursday. Uh, and then again, the chair will make decisions as to whether we, our next meeting will be two weeks from now uh, and whether we will proceed with every two weeks from this point on. Our schedule is perhaps more truncated than that. Second provision deals with questioning witnesses. Obviously, we are a very small committee. I believe that at this point we are the smallest committee in the House of Representatives with only six members. Uh, the questioning time we've arrived at uh, in Clause 2, 30 minutes for each side. Uh, the chair and ranking member shall determine how to allocate that questioning time. Uh, and of course, as always, the chair retains discretion to permit additional rounds of questions and to permit additional questioning time. But the baseline should be 30 minutes allocated to each side for one hour total. Uh, final provision, clause three, refers to the time for submission of supplemental minority or additional views. Time frame that we've agreed on is three calendar days. Uh, unless the committee should agree to a different time, the decision of the chairman, the concurrence of the ranking member. Um, again, very simple, very expeditious. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Latra and I were also asked to, again, to consider the question of a timetable, a template for how we intend to do our business. And we've decided to not publish that document, not to make it public, 
but there is a draft document that will be circulated internally to members and staff that does lay out a projected schedule. For those who are here and who are interested, uh, I will summarize it this way without getting into the details. We intend to be expeditious. We intend to finish the public hearing phase of this work before the House adjourns this year. We intend to leave ourselves adequate time before the end of the year to complete a written report that may or may not include supplemental and minority views, but we intend to get the hearing phase of this finished before we adjourn. The schedule, Mr. Chairman, that we have formally arrived at uh, is one that will begin with the foundational work. As you will see today, we will have a witness who will not act as a fact witness, but who will lay a foundation for the August 2nd vote and various technology and machinery associated with it. We will move forward. We will have witnesses who will talk about the rules and customs of the House with respect to voting. And then toward the end of our work, Mr. Chairman, we will have fact witnesses. Mr. LaTourette and I have arrived at a tentative list of fact witnesses. Fact witnesses defined as those who have specific knowledge of the events and dispute that night staff members and relevant members, and once again, that list has been circulated internally. Um, if it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman, I would like to yield now to Mr. LaTourette for any commentary on the rules or any amendment that he may offer. I, I, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis, and I, I want to, uh, again, publicly indicate what a pleasure it's been to work with you on this process. And we, we just have one minor dispute that will be the subject of an amendment whenever the, the chair feels that that's appropriate, dealing with uh, the quorum of the committee. Uh, but I, I think that we've arrived at a, a good rules package. I think uh, there's been great input on both sides, and we're ready to move forward. And so that's all I have to say about the rules until I offer the amendment. On, on the schedule, I, I want to make a, a couple of observations about the, the schedule, uh, and that is I, I think that it's our work can really help to uh, educate other members of the House as to what the traditions are here. Everybody's busy. A lot of people don't know how the electronic voting system got installed. A lot of people don't know what the rules are. And, and, and that leads to some people getting mad when maybe they shouldn't get mad. Uh, and so I, I think by laying the foundation today with the clerk's office and then moving through historians in the next couple of, uh, of hearings and talking about the precedence of the House, the, the only uh, cautionary uh, note, and I know that you've been great in working with us on, on resources, the schedule that uh, Congressman Davis and I have talked about do contemplate having in place staff for the committee by the time we finish that history section so that we can appropriately prepare for the gathering of the facts relative to August the 2nd. And I want to I want to uh, publicly thank also the Clerk of the House, Ms. Miller, uh, in uh, not only what she and her staff have done to date, uh, but echoing my comments in my opening remarks, a lot of people think that because the Democratic uh, Party is the majority that she is the Democratic Clerk of the House. Well, she's not. She's the Clerk of the House. And the way that she and her staff have discharged their responsibilities to this moment in time in, in saving evidence and identifying for Congressman Davis and I who on the dais might know things, who might not know things, is really exemplary. And I want to thank you uh, publicly for that. And whenever you're ready, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Uh, it's not at the desk, because we don't have a desk yet, but it's, I have an amendment. <laughs> we have a table. <laughs> uh, well, let me call up the draft committee rules that actually the consensus will be considered as read and open to amendment uh, And I have such an amendment. I, I believe, uh, Members have the amendment, if you know what it is, maybe we'll, we'll circulate it. The, uh, the amendment deals with the issue of quorum that we were not able to, uh, to agree on. The, uh, the standard rules of the House for committees, uh, happy to. Um, this is a parliamentary inquiry of the chair. If we don't have a clerk, is, there a, is it appropriate that uh, we would have the clerk support the amendment? Or we just simply have the member read it. Why, why don't I read the amendment? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Some have suggested that I should kind of play. Uh, <laughs> amendment to the rules of the Select Committee to investigate the irregularities of August uh, 2nd, 2007, offered by Representative La Tourette. Strike uh, parentheses three in the second sentence and insert parentheses four. Add at the end of the following new section four a quorum uh, for the purpose of taking testimony and receiving evidence. One member from the majority and one member from the minority shall constitute a quorum 
unless otherwise agreed to by the ranking minority member. Uh, Mr. Lott, Tourette, on your amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The, the rules, as, as proposed by Mr. Davis, uh, the standard rules of the House would indicate that a, a quorum uh, of this committee would be three members. Uh, and uh, again, uh, standard committee rules would indicate that for the purposes of taking uh, testimony, uh, you'd only need two members, and those members could be of the same party. We have only one evenly split uh, committee uh, currently in the House today, and that's the Ethics Committee. And uh, those rules indicate that they cannot uh, be take action or begin proceedings or take testimony unless a majority is present. And, and that, by, uh, by definition, because it's five and five, indicates that there have to be six members and somebody's got to be from the other party. I mean, you can't, you can't get to six without having both Republicans and Democrats in the room. Uh, this uh, simple uh, uh, change to the, uh, the quorum, I, I can't imagine a situation where all six of us wouldn't be present. Uh, but were there such a situation, uh, we are proposing that a quorum for the purposes of receiving testimony and evidence uh, be two uh, rather than three at a minimum, and that uh, we have to have at least one Republican and one Democrat in the room. And I yield back. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll claim time uh, to speak in opposition to the amendment and just to give some perspective to the committee. On the difference, uh, it is sometimes difficult for everyone to appreciate to translate these rules which are written in English into the plain English that we speak every day. Uh, uh, so I will try to do that. The difference in the rules as they have been submitted in the La Tourette Amendment is a fairly simple one. Normally, the rules don't contemplate a bipartisan quorum. Rules translated to a committee of this size would establish a quorum for taking testimony of not less than two. Uh, Mr. Lacherette's amendment would add the additional requirement that it be a bipartisan quorum, one Democrat and one Republican. And I certainly understand Mr. Lacherette's perspective. And it, it goes without saying that our colleagues meant this to be an evenly balanced body. The resolution, frankly, could have been amended on the floor to give Democrats the majority on this committee. Uh, my leadership chose not to do that. Uh, and if I can be so bold as to speak for them, I suspect it was because they knew it was important that the final product of this select committee not be one that was rendered on a party line basis, but that there be a final product that reflected bipartisan consensus. And that was the aim and the goal of this committee. So we didn't preserve the advantage that the voters, frankly, delivered to this party last November. Um, I think 100% agree with Mr. LaTourette. I cannot imagine a circumstance where we would proceed to take testimony and not have bipartisan representation in this room. For us to do that would frankly flout the understanding that our colleagues charge us with. Um, we presented the rules as they are, again, to strive for consistency with the rules as they are employed by the committees. And because other committees don't include a partisan point, we've chosen not to do that or to have a bipartisan requirement. Um, uh, so I will make that observation, Mr. Chairman, and then yield back. Uh, the ranking member, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Any Chairman. I'll, I'll be very brief. I, I take the gentleman from Alabama's point uh, to heart. I, um, I think there, uh, it, it is a valid point to say that the majority reform contemplates that if one party is in the majority. But um, uh, in this case, I, I believe uh, Mr. Lotteret's amendment is appropriate, Mr. Chairman, and, and to, to ensure uh, confidence of the membership and the broader public in the, in the bipartisan nature of our deliberations. I would heartily endorse the uh, Lotteret amendment. Uh, well, in that spirit, uh, um, the gentleman yields back. In, 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 in that spirit, uh, Mr. Penson, we've been talking about bipartisan committee. Uh, I will support the amendment uh, by the gentleman. And uh, can I withdraw any objection, Mr. Chairman? Thank you. Um, so, um, if there is no further discussion, uh, the question is uh, to the draft. Committee rules as amended by uh, Representative Lott. I'm sorry. I got. I got to really demonstrating my knowledge and familiarity uh, with the rules of the House. Uh, I think that uh, underscores the observation by Mr. Mr. Tourette that this uh, select committee provides all members 
uh, an opportunity to educate themselves as well as the, uh, the people about the practices and the procedures and the rules of the House. Uh, on the amendment, all those in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Uh, having uh, no need for a roll call vote, the amendment is adopted. Um, if there is no further discussion, the question is on agreeing to the draft committee rules. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed to say no, hearing none. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the select committee's rules are adopted. The second agenda item is adoption of the interim report. Uh, as members know, the interim report must be filed by September 30th, which is Sunday. Um, and it's my understanding the House is not expected to be in session tomorrow, um, which is Friday. Uh, at our preliminary meeting, we requested that the, the Congressional Research Service prepare a draft interim report and provide that document to Mr. Pence and myself, which CRS has done. Uh, we have disseminated it to uh, our colleagues uh, on both sides. Uh, and the document before the Select Committee today uh, reflects any changes suggested by committee members to that draft. Um, if there is any discussion or amendments, is there any discussion or amendments to the interim report? Mr. Pence. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, uh, let me just say that I, I am uh, uh, very grateful for um, the uh, approach which you endorsed early on in some of our preliminary discussions that that we would um, fulfill our statutory obligation uh, in the September 30, 2007 report without going forward into uh, debates about facts and controversies uh, that the committee would not have the ability to have investigated up to that point. Uh, I believe this, uh, this report uh, uh, lays a solid foundation for us to begin our work. Uh, and it is, it is uh, I believe, will, will serve to inform um, uh, the members of Congress about uh, our work to date and uh, the manner whereby we uh, uh, intend to go forward. And uh, uh, that in combination with the deliberations uh, today, I believe, um, uh, represents a, uh, a good start. Uh, I, I, would, uh, I would raise the issue um, that while while we, uh, we did move um, a recitation of, of the, um, the rules cited by CRS as relevant to this discussion to an appendix, um, I, I would like to engage the chair in a colloquy uh, uh, about the, that the inclusion of these rules in an appendix to the report is descriptive and not proscriptive. I, th I think we, we don't know yet, Mr. Chairman, what rules of the House will bear upon uh, this inquiry until we uh, enter into a detailed investigation of the facts and circumstances surrounding what occurred on August the 2nd. Um, I am mindful, though, of the good faith effort uh, uh, by staff at the Congressional Research Service to simply identify rules that may pertain to our inquiry, but I might, I might welcome a colloquy with you about ensuring the members of the minority uh, that the appendix is, uh, in a very real sense, uh, merely a good faith effort to describe the rules that we believe at this moment to be relevant to the inquiry. If the gentleman would yield, I would, to yield. I would concur with uh, your interpretation. Um, clearly, um, you know, there, uh, this is uh, a product uh, by the Congressional uh, Research Service. and. Uh, is not meant to be uh, uh, comprehensive without further review by the, uh, by the committee. Um, I would also note that it, uh, it does not draw uh, any conclusions. Um, my own observation was with the naming of the select committees uh, involving the term irregularities, um, I think if I had been aware of uh, the naming of the committee while the resolution was considered on the floor, I would have 
raised the issue that uh, that was conclusionary and it was really the task and the responsibility of this select committee to determine what the facts are. Um, but that's of no great consequence, uh, and I certainly concur with your interpretation of uh, the appendix as drafted by the uh, Congressional Research. Re reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that uh, clarification. The only other issue I would raise uh, as, uh, as, a, as we worked through this draft um, um, is the issue that you mentioned in your opening statement and other colleagues mentioned, and that is the question of resources. There is a line on page 3 that makes specific reference to a, a copy of a letter. I know there's been a, a good faith effort on the part of the majority and minority staff to speak with one voice uh, to request of the leadership uh, of both parties in the Congress to find a means either by resolution or, or um, through leadership accounts to, to fund uh, this committee. I don't believe we've arrived at either uh, an agreement with leadership on that. I don't believe we're quite to a letter yet, uh, but I want to renew uh, to the committee and uh, to any that would be looking on um, that we need the resources to engage in the kind of solemn and serious and fair inquiry that I believe every member of this committee uh, uh, deemed this morning to be appropriate uh, uh, in, in this matter. And so you know, with that, we, we may uh, I, Mr. Chairman, uh, may need to make, uh, by unanimous consent, a, a change to the draft relative to the resources issue, but I would take the opportunity to renew my profound concern that we resolve that issue, as Mr. La Tourette said, well before we arrive at the truly fact-gathering aspects uh, of this inquiry, or it will, in my judgment, both hamper the, our ability to complete our work and, more likely, simply delay our ability to complete this inquiry in an expeditious manner. And, and with that, I would yield back. I, th I thank the gentleman for his observations. I concur. And I would hope uh, that by Monday or Tuesday of next week, uh, given our, uh, our rather hectic uh, schedule today and the fact that we're in recess tomorrow, that we will um, have that uh, letter uh, to our mutual satisfaction uh, completed and forwarded for expedited action by uh, the leadership on both sides, and I'm confident that that can uh, occur. Um, if there is no further discussion, the question is on agreeing to the interim report. Are those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the interim report is agreed to. Without objection, the staff uh, are authorized to make sure such changes may, uh, as may be necessary to reflect the actions of the select committee. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Uh, in order to meet our September 30th deadline and to provide all members of the House with rapid access to the interim report. Mr. Pence and I have agreed that we will insert the interim report in today's congressional record. The committee can, at a later time, have it printed. Uh, the third... Chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Pence. Uh, this falls in the category of parliamentary inquiry, but an inquiry of the chair. Uh, I, I would uh, request Chairman, as with all other committees, we ensure a transcript also be published in the, the normal course of business of the proceeding uh, of the select committee. Okay. Without objection. The third agenda is to hear from the Office of the Clerk. Uh, the Office of the Clerk provided the select committee with a letter listing an initial inventory of 21 items, which the clerk's office has preserved for use in the committee's investigation. I'm going to have to consult for a moment. Okay. The um, 
Russell Gore in the office of the clerk uh, is here to explain the items listed in the letter. He is accompanied by the distinguished clerk of the house, Lorraine Miller. Mr. Gore. Good morning. And uh, right. members of the select committee, we are. We are delighted to be with you today and to explain some of the uh, items that we have preserved. If I, if you'll allow me to just make a couple of points as we uh, get uh, involved in this, I take personally. Um, the charge of being the clerk of the house seriously. And our main objective is to take the votes, tally those votes, and preserve the records of the U.S. House of Representatives, and we do that. One of the other things that uh, I, I want to assure you, we look at this um, as uh, Mr. Latourette uh, mentioned, in a nonpartisan way. We are your agents uh, to make sure that your votes are recorded and recorded accurately. And so we take that very, very seriously. Our staff is excellent. Um, I must say that in, in all candor. We, we take the, our, our job very, very seriously. And, and politics uh, really doesn't come into play. Uh, even in any part of our, our uh, work for you. I wanted to take a second just to walk you through uh, one of the things that I wanted to do, and I pledged to you the openness of the Office of the Clerk. Um, taking it seriously is one thing, but executing that and giving you the kind of information and support you need uh, for your work, we will do. Uh, and I hope we try to demonstrate that. We are, one of the things that we did on the night of um, these events, I sent an email out before the House resolution was passed to all of our staff to say, let's save everything you have, no matter what it is, no matter if we didn't even try to make a determination if it was relevant or not. Uh, that didn't matter. We wanted to preserve everything that we could uh, in order to be of help. So the documents and the data that we um, preserved um, were done immediately um, because of that uh, resolution 611. So um, we were very broad. There may be duplicates. Um, we erred on the side of preservation. There are three offices that are basically involved, and I can go through this fairly quickly. There are three offices of the Office of the Clerk, of our nine offices that are basically involved. The Office of the Official Reporters, voila, the ladies that are uh, taking um, the stenographic work. The Office of the Legislative Computer Services and our Legislative Operations Personnel. I took the liberty of asking the chief of each of those offices, uh, Joe Strickland of Official Reporters, uh, the Legislative Computer Services, Goldie Van Zandt, who's accompanied by our um, Deputy Clerk, um, Ed Sorison, and our Legislative Operations uh, person, uh, Francis Chaparty. Uh, Francis has uh, the, taken the liberty of, of bringing a couple of um, her guys, Kevin and DeAndre, who were there the night in question. So if there, you have any questions of them, they're here and available. Um, so the documents that are preserved come from these three groups, from official reporters, the legislative computer systems, and the legislative operations staff. So in the official reporters, um, what you have is a transcript of the floor proceedings. All the documents from the initial trans, from the transcription to the transmission, and then what actually goes to GPO, the government printing office. 
Um, you have the steno files you, that um, are electronic files that contain the shorthand transcription. You have um, the shorthand files are then converted to full English, and then they are saved to text files. Those text files actually get printed. So you see the paper of those text files. We have those for you. And then we send to GPO case lugs. And these are the technical terms about, these are the partial um, segments that go and actually are actually inserted in the congressional record. So periodically during the day, case lugs are sent to GPO for printing. There's also, you have the auto files. These are the recordings of the floor activity through the feeds by electronic equipment and by cassette. And that's what you have from the official reporters. Do you want to add anything, Russell, to that? or um, No, thank you very much. Uh, I, I believe that that and those, that item, that description um, consists of essentially most of what uh, is items 1 through 14 of the August 4th letter that um, you've been looking at. So I, I think what we thought would be helpful, so um, um, the clerk has explained, you know, the, the, the steno files, the text files, the case lugs, and as you'll see, there's, a, there's some redundancy in uh, items 1 through 14. That's in part because even if we had five versions or five copies of it, we saved everything. Um, we thought it might be helpful if, if, if members of the committee have questions mm -hmm. regarding items 1 through 14 with that background, um, maybe ask us and we could provide uh, and, some further. And Mr. Strickland is here. Um, Joe? Where'd Joe go? Okay, there he is. If you have any questions, we'd love to. I call on any members of the committee that uh, have uh, any inquiries to make or have to suggest any questions. Just a lot there. I, if it's uh, appropriate, I, uh, a couple of things. I do have some questions about um, just what the stuff is that's been retained, but I thought it would be instructive as well, Mr. Chairman, it might help other members as we move forward. We, we have a, a poster over here that we uh, took from the, the night of the vote before all hell broke loose that has people sitting calmly in their chairs, and I thought it might be instructive if we put up the poster yeah. and ask the clerk and Mr. Gore to identify what jobs the people at the dais have. Uh, and what they do. Uh, see, everybody's calm, nothing bad's happening here, so. Uh, but uh, I, I think we all know the presiding officer, uh, the Speaker Pro Tem, Mr. McNulty, but either Mr. Gore or Madam Clerk, could, could you identify the other people at the dais and sure. what their jobs are? The, um, the display that the TCR blocks the um, stenographic folks in the well. Those are the the folks that actually um, um, are recording the proceedings. And then on the rostrum, there are a number of folks. Lorraine, would you kind yeah. of maybe yes. stand? Sure. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's causing uh, problems in terms of having a recording. Kevin is the reading clerk. Uh -huh. And then. And, and what's her job? Well, she actually, it's, it's um, multifaceted. What you actually see her doing is getting up, reading the bill. If, if there's an amendment or the bill is being introduced, she does it. But what Kevin and Kevin is also a reading clerk, what they are very expert at is knowing and anticipating your floor actions. So they can, if there is a, a some kind of motion that's coming up, they anticipate that so they make sure that um, um, they are prepared, uh, anticipating the presiding officer and what the parliamentarian may, may suggest. Well, it, just uh, during the course of a vote, it's my understanding, I, don't want, I want you to tell us, but the, the reading clerk is involved in changes, is that? Yes. Okay. Kevin will announce, the reading clerk will announce, for instance, um, um, if a member decides to change a vote, off I on no for a member, or Mr. Um, Delahunt votes I. And so, especially when the members come to the well, 
this is a this is an interesting operation of what happens in the well. Right, the other, yes, sir. I, is that the customary seat for the reading club? Yes, that is the customary seat for the reading club. The other um, person that's really key, there are two other people that are very key. The seated tally clerk, who happens to be DeAndre here, and the standing tally clerk. When members are voting, when they come to the well, that standing tally clerk then takes the member, writes their name on the card, hands it to the tally clerk who notes it, who put the district on there, the roll, call number. roll call number of that vote, that particular vote, and they hand that well card to the sitting tally clerk. The seated tally clerk is at the computer, at the EVS system itself. And as members vote their well cards, that gets entered into the computer. And, and then the, there's nobody standing, but my understanding on August the 2nd, Kevin Hanrahan was the yes, standing Kevin tally was clerk. Yes. And I think he's sitting at the moment. He's not standing because we're not doing a vote. There he is. And, and so he, he takes the well cards and hands them up to DeAndre. Right. And, and what does DeAndre do during, DeAndre the, during a vote? DeAndre has, well, when he hands the card to them, DeAndre then enters the member's vote into the EVS system. So there are fluctuations because he's entering those well card votes into the system as the way it's going. And, and does he, as the seated tally clerk, turn the machine off and on? I mean, how, how does it even go on? He controls it, okay. yes. Okay. yes. Is there anybody else at the uh, dais in this photograph that uh, is involved in the actual taking of a 15 or a five minute vote from your office? The taking of a vote? Francis, not? No, the journal clerk just records the. Um, She's recording. Call That's the journal clerk. The tallies. All right. Bill clerk. Okay. And, and the woman in yellow is uh, not Kevy, the other woman in yellow. Uh, that's uh, Gay. And what does she do? Gay works for the parliamentarian. She's the timekeeper, I, I like to call it. Okay. She's the person that says to the presiding officer, you have this much time left in a, you know, on a boat, or you need to recognize. She's the kind of the eyes and ears for the presiding officer. And then on the other side of Mr. McNulty, just, just for the record purposes, that that's the parliamentarian. Yes, that's and that's the parliamentarian. Yes. Okay, thank you. Did the chairman yield this for just a moment? The function of the standing clerk, or the standing tally clerk, clerk yes. is to receive from the members. From the well, yes, sir. From the well, the, 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 voting, uh, yes. the voting card. Yes. And that standing tally clerk then turns around, submits it to the sitting tally clerk. Yes, after he, that, that usually that tally clerk will then will note on there the roll call vote that's in process that he's voting on, he or she is voting on. Right, but the only function, if you will, of the standing tally clerk is to receive it from a member and, and make and sure turn that around and, and give it to physically the, hand it to the sitting tally clerk. And at the end of the, when the vote is, the presiding officer indicates that a vote is finished, that standing tally clerk will then will write out the tally. That based on what they have in the machine. Yes, and then hand it to the parliament. Yes, standing. Standing. Yes, and then we'll hand give it to the parliamentarian, who then ultimately gives it to the presiding officer. Thank you. Uh, just a couple. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions on the picture. I, I do have a question. A couple questions about the letter, and I appreciate the the chair's indulgence. The the wave files that you identified and retained, and my understanding that those are audio. Uh, files that are maintained by the office of the official reporter, and and, and they may conversations with you, Mr. Gore. They, they may or may not. They may contain more audio than went to the C-SPAN or less. Uh, I, have you have you retained those in a in a way that there is a cassette that each member of this committee could have to listen to those? Wave? Have you put the 45 minutes together? Uh, um, I, we have not yet put anything together in the way you've described. Part of what we've done with the evidence is it's been stored. We haven't done anything with it so that once the committee decided what uh, they wanted, we would then, uh, with the committee's approval, um, make copies, et cetera. I know that hasn't been done. 
Mr. Lachman, if I can just uh, just just clarify so it's, it's so it's clear, sure. the way um, after you and I spoke, uh, we went back and we looked into into this, and the way we understand it is that um, the microphones on on the floor, um, um, while they're all the same microphones, they actually have several, several different lines that go into them, and so for instance, the video and the audio that's with the video is control is one line that's controlled by I believe it's the office of the chief administrative officer. Uh, whereas the wave files that you're referring to, those come from a different line in the same microphones. Right. Um, the person who turns them on and turns them off, for instance, when a person gets up to speak at the podium, may turn them on slightly before or slightly after because it's a different person. So to the extent they may contain more information, it would be based on something of that nature. Sure, and, I, and I, that's what I understood, Mr. Chairman. I would, I would just ask in that regard that um, we all have a copy of the videotape of that night. I, if, just so I can get myself ready, and I would think the other members might want to do that too. If we could ask the clerk's office, with your, if you want unanimous consent or whatever, to to see if we can ask the official recorder to put together these audio files for the time in question. I mean, on either side of when the vote started, when the vote ended, uh, and then we can determine whether they they have more or less information that may be available on the videotape. Yeah, I, I would, you know, at this moment take. Uh, Take Ms. Delatourette's uh, request as a unanimous, unanimous consent uh, request, and there is no objection. And I would request the uh, the office to. Right. I, gentlemen, you uh, sure. on this point, I'd like to follow up very quickly on these wave files. Where are these recorded from? We we understand that there's there's one audio track that one, that is preserved that was the audio track of what was broadcast right. that night. Right. Uh, it, it, I, I've asked Lorraine, is it your understanding that with regard to video audio tracks, the only audio tracks that have been preserved is the audio track of the video file that was broadcast? Is that your understanding? That's my understanding, but I need to... I believe that is the case, yes. We, we, we were, we'll double check, but that was represented you know, to us in some informal conversations down in the, uh, for lack of a better term, the control room okay. for the video operations. Uh, to Mr. Lafrette's point, because I'll, I'll have a few of my own questions on my own time, but to follow up on uh, Mr. Lafrette's point, these wave files represent different audio tracks, and my question is. What microphones are you referring to the wave files being collected from? Are these the floor microphones? Are they microphones on the DS itself? Let's defer to Joe. Joe Strickland is our uh, chief of uh, official reports. Since the uh, stenal machines that our reporters use on the floor actually have built into them a digital recording device. There's a line run right into the steno machine. And that feed that's going directly into the reporter's machine is coming from the microphones that are on the floor controlled by, um, as uh, Russ was saying, controlled by the LCS folks upstairs, turning them on, turning them off when they need it. There's no ambient mic like this sitting on a table someplace. There's no open room mic. This is a means, she's doing it right now. The means for the reporter to have a better hearing. It's difficult to hear on. Let me let me ask, and this may be a subject of a technical hearing later with some of the technical people. Just, but your impression is is what the stenographer is hearing is that different than what the members are hearing or someone watching on television might be hearing, or do you think they're Only essentially the same the track? Extent, it's the same microphone only to the extent that our feed may be turned on and turned off at a different time than the feed that okay. C-SPAN may turn on. That, that's very it's helpful. the same microphone. Thank you. I yield back. I, I just have two more questions, Mr. Chairman, if you permit me. The, you, in your, uh, your letter to us with a list of 21 things, you identify uh, seven uh, employees of, of the offices that you've mentioned who you ask that their emails be retained. Uh -huh. uh, and my, my question in a in a response after our meeting, Mr. Gore, you said, and nobody wants to read anybody's emails, but you, you indicate that some of these emails may contain privileged 
came from communications. I'm, I'm wondering what would a privileged communication be? I, I, I get what personal stuff is, but what, what would be a privileged communication? Well, well for instance, um, communications that I, as the council, may have had with um, the clerk. Um, additionally, I also, my emails would contain, um, I have a dual role from uh, having previously worked in the Office of House Employment Council, uh, where uh, we represent individual offices, and that there are communications in those emails that would be attorney-client privilege. And that's largely what I was referring to. Without, of course, we haven't looked at these emails, so that right. it's right. conceivable there could be some other privilege that would apply, but that's the one I was we were but referring to. I, I guess my question is, can, can you foresee any privileged communication dealing with the circumstances of this roll call A14? I can't. I can't. Okay, I, I couldn't either. That's why I thought I asked that question. Last question I have, Mr. Chairman, and on these 21 things, uh, and you, you described the, uh, the tally sheet before, Madam Clerk. I, I don't see a tally sheet was retained from that evening. Is that right? There wasn't a tally sheet. What, 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 I'm sorry. A tally sheet, no. There wasn't one. So, so just so I'm clear, the, the standing tally clerk never prepared a tally sheet for this vote? No, because we were still voting and there were votes going on in the well. No, no, I got that. But, okay. but was, first of all, my question is, did you retain a tally sheet? The answer is no. And, and the second question is, was there ever a tally sheet? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, Mr. Miller, pick up on the very last question Mr. Lafayette asked, and let me try to make sure I understand exactly what is a tally sheet. A tally sheet is the sheet that the tally clerk with the votes would actually give to the parliamentarian to give to the presiding officer to announce the vote. And that is based on, it's a combination of all of the votes um, from the well, from our voting stations, and uh, that's what we, that's what we announce. And that always is the same that we have in the computer, in our EVS system. What triggers the writing is the tally sheet is handwritten. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. What event triggers, first of all, what individual is it the tally clerk who literally writes in the information on the tally sheet or is it someone else? No, the tally clerk okay. writes. The standing or the sitting? The, the standing one. Okay. Yes. What event literally triggers the tally clerk to fill in the final tally sheet? The presiding officer has a litany of things that they may say. Is there a member who wishes to vote? Is there a member in the chamber who wishes to change a vote? Based on those kind of declarations by the presiding chair, um, that is the way we, um, we proceed to end the vote. So, so let me, I guess, state it my way and then see if you agree with this. The standing tally clerk prepares the sheet when he or she believes that the vote is about to be called. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. And the tally clerk would not prepare a tally sheet in the normal course of business if he or she did not believe that a vote was about to be called. Absolutely. Um, Francis, is that the... Uh, yes, normally the tally clerk will. Um, Francis, for the record, could you identify yourself? Oh, I'm, I'm Francis Chicago, I'm the chief of I'm the chief of legislative operations. And normally uh, what we do is uh, when the, uh, the chair asks if there are any changes, that signals to the tally clerk that the time actually is usually at zero and that uh, they're going to start to close the vote. And so uh, what we do is as soon as he said, are there any changes, the tally clerk will, if no one is down in the well, will turn um, close the vote stations. Let me stop you at that point. Is it the discretion of the tally clerk to decide whether or not to close the vote stations? If you understand the, the way the job works day in and yes, day out. Yes, it is. Well, if the tally clerk closes when only the chair says, does anyone wish to change their vote? And there are members that are not coming down uh, into the well or into the chamber. A lot of times people uh, will yell one more, one more, okay. and so the tally clerks will leave the uh, electronic Mr. voting Chairman. stations open. Mr. Chairman, I was, uh, 
I'll, I'll yield. Gentlemen, yield. I, I would just simply ask the chair uh, if uh, the gentleman from Alabama's uh, uh, inquiry, while while certainly in the bounds of the committee, but but, but to ask uh, our current witness what the discretion of the position is or relative to the practice. I mean, it may be useful for us to focus these witnesses on what the practice is. We'll, we'll, we'll be hearing shortly from witnesses about what the tradition uh, of the institution is. Sure, and, and, and I'll certainly you know, take that correction, reclaiming my time. I'm just trying to, since I don't know that we will hear from you, ladies and gentlemen, again, I want to sure. make sure that I understand what the job is. Yes. You know, what, what the job description is these individuals. And Mr. Davis, we, we do invite the committee. This is a very interesting process. Uh, and to understand how the EVS system works, we'd be delighted. It, for months, I've been sitting out there on the floor observing it. I was, having worked around here a number of years is one thing, but to actually know how that, how the voting system works is fascinating and something you, uh, we invite you to um, if the gentleman, you know, it, it's the intention of, it, it, it's my intention to uh, take a view, if you will, uh, and, you know, in, accommodate the uh, member's schedule as well as uh, the, the floor schedule, just simply to walk down walk on the floor, the floor and, and have the appropriate personnel uh, explain to us in very tangible Wait. terms what's what happening. Happened. But let me go back to my question, perhaps the tally clerk again. The absence of a tally sheet in, in, in infers what, or what do you imply, Ms. Miller, from the absence of a tally sheet? That a vote has, is still open. <laughs> we have not closed a vote if you don't have a tally sheet. The presiding officer, um, we look for the tick ups and the tick downs. If there, if there, there's no activity um, in the system, where members are coming in to vote one way or the other, and it's stagnant and stable, um, based on the presiding officer's uh, instructions of what he says while he's presiding. That's what we, that triggers uh, our actions. And again, just to clarify Mr. Lottrette's point, there is not and has not been a tally sheet in connection with the disputed August 2nd vote. No. Never was a tally sheet. No. Let me shift to the board itself, which is what members are able to see when we're in the chamber. I understand we're not getting to the factual disputes, but again, I, I want to clarify the procedure. When final flashes across the board, when the word final flashes across the board and there's a number, what event triggers the display of the word final? When final flashes across the board, that means that we are in the process of closing down the voting stations. Okay? So on the floor, there are 46 voting stations on the floor that are available for members to vote. And so final means that we're closing down the voting stations and then the, we're moving to a final process of closing out that vote. But that doesn't mean, necessarily, that the vote is closed. So the word final could appear on the board without a vote being closed? Yes. What member of the staff makes the determination as to when final would be displayed? Well, again, everything is triggered by the presiding officer and what that presiding officer says when they're in the chair, which triggers our reaction to go to step two, step three, or step four in order to close the vote. So the voting stations may be open, but members come to the well. Or the, the voting stations may be closed, but members still come to the well to vote, even with final up there. So it's, it depends on what the instructions we get from the presiding officer. So the display of the word final itself does not have any determinative Consequence. It, it, it. No. Okay. And if, if, if the, no, no, that, that is correct. What, normally, what happens when the final? Uh, Don't you come to the chair? The tally clerk is in the process of closing the vote down, 
and the chair is uh, saying, you know, uh, the tally clerk is listening to the chair. And apparently the chair probably was in the process of saying uh, the motion uh, is agreed to and without objection. And while they're saying that, the tally clerk has a screen, which they are. There's a, a, a button that they click. You go to terminate vote, um, set time to final, and release the boards and the summary boards. And who literally does that? The tally clerk. And they're doing that as the speaker is announced. The seated tally clerk. The seated tally clerk. If the gentleman here for a moment, yes. um, why, why the necessity for displaying final when, in fact, it's not final? I mean, is there, does it just pop up? Or? Well, it's. But it's the tally click that triggers the display that. Well, I think for us, it's a That's signal that, yeah, that we're going, this is ending the vote for us okay. technically. And um, that has been traditionally the way uh, the system has been set up. And so we're, it, it actually signals that we're on the road to a final vote. So in, in closing it out. Let me try to shift gears to a, another aspect of the physical evidence. Those of us who are on the floor obviously can look at the well and we can observe whether there's flux, whether there's activity, whether people appear to be picking up cards to change their votes. Sure. Is there any, tell me which of these items would be the visual preservation that night of people being in the well around the vote cards? Are there any items that would capture that moment for our review? We do have a, a DVD that captures that. And then um, one of the things that we did, we preserved the well cards. So we have the original well cards um, that the members cast their votes on. Yeah. And this is my last question for you, Ms. Miller. If you can look at the list of 21 items, let me direct you to number 19. And I'm, I'm just uncertain what it means. That's why I ask about it. It says 18 well card votes, including two that were not processed from Majority Leader Hoyer, which was a duplicate of Minority Leader Boehner. What does that mean? Well, Mr. Hoyer, as I understand it, um, decided that he wanted to vote no and had already voted no. And so it was a duplicate. Um, Mr. Boehner um, was going to vote no because I, I believe he wanted to um, yes. reconsider. Yeah. And a motion to reconsider, just so we're clear on the rules, that has to be made by a member who, in effect, was on the well, non-caring yeah. side. OK, right. I'm sorry, I'm on the caring side. A motion to reconsider has to come from someone who's on the caring side. Okay. Absolutely. All right. OK, and how about what, and, and so we, we save those. OK, I'll yield back. Uh, Mr. Pence. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I, I want to thank the clerk for uh, service. I don't know if we've done that yet, but I know I speak for everyone on the panel. Appreciate the uh, dignity and integrity with which you approach your office every day. Thank you. Uh, and your staff. Um, let, me, let me ask, with regard to your testimony today, you said that uh, you alerted your staff to, quote, save everything you have, and that that was, quote, done immediately. I, I'm, um, I, I wasn't entirely clear on what precipitated your request to preserve documents and emails. Was it the events of August 2nd, or was it the passage of the resolution that formed the select committee on August 3rd? Actually, I sent the email before the passage of the resolution 611, simply because I wanted us internally, irregardless of what, um, we had no idea that the select committee was coming up, but I wanted us as an office to know what happened here. And so that's why initially um, I wanted to make sure we had everything that we possibly could to make sure we knew what happened. Let me, uh, um, there's been some talk of this um, 
the standing tally clerk, the seated tally clerk, and this business of tally sheets. Yes. Um, there were, uh, with the with the chairman's indulgence, and I and I would uh, stipulate that we haven't established this timeline yet. But it, but in looking at the video that every member of the committee has viewed, in a two-minute period of time, there the vote was actually called twice. Um, by the chair uh, at 214 and one of which may have simply been inadvertent. I, I, my question to you is, is, you said this morning there were no tally sheets. Uh, were there no tally sheets relative to either call, to your knowledge? No. During that two no. minute period? No. Okay. No tally sheet. All right. No. Um, Does yield for I'd be pleased. clarification? Be pleased. And, and, and I think this is probably just an inadvertent phrasing on the part of my friend, the ranking member, but obviously we're not here to put into evidence or to make any representations regarding the events and factual dispute that night. So I simply wanted to clarify the ranking member's observations about there being two instances when the vote was called. That is possibly a point of the, the, the dispute, if I'm not correct, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, reclaiming my time, it, it certainly uh, is possibly a point of dispute, and I would uh, concede the point. And I was not, inter not interested at this point in beginning the factual debate, but, uh, only to clarify whether or not there was at any point in the relevant time of vote calling tally sheets no relative to this final. Kevin? No tally No. no. Um, if the record could reflect that. Okay, sorry. Kevin Hemran was the standing tally clerk on the evening in question, and DeAndre was the seated uh, tally clerk. And he, he testified from the gallery here that there was no tally right. sheet. Right. Let me get on to what uh, interests me um, um, as much, if not more, and that is this business of electronic voting, the electronic voting system. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering very much uh, when I, as a member, go to the floor and vote, when I vote by a card, my, the light by my name on the wall, and, and as I watch it, the light board that flanks the chamber changes almost instantaneously. Yes. Where when I turn a card in, to the standing clerk, there is a time lag where I presume someone in your organization is entering that data that appears on the wall. Can you describe the differences? Is there a is there human discretion in the electronic voting system between when a member votes and when it is displayed on either of the light boards in the chamber? And what's the role of um, the inputting into the electronic voting system uh, at the DS? The, when a member goes to a voting station and inserts his card, presses his vote choice, mm -hmm. that is an instantaneous mechanical re rec uh, recording of what that member votes, instantaneously, correct only? You stick the card in the receptacle, you vote I, nay, or present, it's instantly displayed. The difference in the well card voting is that that member's name and the actual vote, all of that has to be reported. That takes a few seconds, and that's where the delay comes in. Then the system. Would the gentleman yield for a moment? Yes, please. It has to be typed in, I guess. Yes. Okay. He, he's sitting so that on accounts the keyboard. He, he has an actual keyboard. And who precisely typing. does that in the picture? The DeAndre <coughs> here, who is our seated tally clerk. The seated tally clerk before him, uh, right below him, is a computer. It's a, it's, it is a computer. And he sits there, and he types it in. And he goes through different kinds of programs to find Mr. Pence. and then types in Pence and your vote. And then that gets recorded on the display. So, and, and I would, uh, and we'll, we'll explore the, the rules of the House as we proceed, Mr. Chairman, but I, 
Uh, I find the rules of the House bereft of any reference to electronic voting, um, to my knowledge. And, and it seems that what you're suggesting is there is human involvement, that the clerk's office is involved when paper ballots are uh, submitted, but there is no human involvement in the electronic voting system. Is that no, beyond, technically correct? Yeah, yeah, technically correct, but it is, it is not something of discretion. The, the, the seated tally clerk is not sitting there saying, oh, well, I'm going to delay putting. The, our object here is to expeditiously enter a member's vote and get it displayed as quickly as they can, and then um, it gets shown on the display boards. Now, if, as I said in my opening statement, um, uh, th this, was, this is a conflict in some respects between parties and the man in the chair and the machine. It, it, it's much more complex than that. But, um, but it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in one more question, and it, and it gentleman from Alabama explored this effectively, but I, I would like to hear it again. The, the term final, or, and I, I'm not sure I know it, what, whether it says time final or final, that appears on the, the rectangular light board in the uh -huh. chamber. Yes. On the sides. Yes. Can you say who activates that? I mean, many of us have, have uh, been on the floor for very long votes. Uh, and the term time final never appeared on the board. Is it the striking of the gavel that initiates that? Is it the paper process uh, of, uh, of the tally clerks? Uh, is, it, is it the tolling of a certain period of time? I'm, I'm just, given the importance of that term that appeared that night, I think we all might agree uh, of the, the inflammatory nature of that term of period of life. Who pushes that button? Again. Go ahead. Tally clerk. Yeah. Sitting or seated? The seated tally clerk. I think it's important to understand that and when, you, when, when, the, when the committee sees the, the voting process, um, there's a menu screen that the tally clerk has, which has a number of different steps. And actually, there's five steps to go through technical, they're not uh, procedural, they're technical steps to do set the vote to final. And setting to final, which I believe actually the, the, the screen says, is I think step three in the process. Um, but the vote is not closed at that point, that's just the, 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 the um, third step in the process. So I just want to make sure that the, the committee understands that this is part of a sub, several steps and the tally clerk doesn't say, okay, I am now going to determine that the vote is final. The tally clerk does that in part of the process, and of course the tally clerk can explain this in more detail, when the, when the tally sheet is being um, completed and the vote is being called. Would the gentleman you might be pleased to you? Yeah, I, during the course of voting, I, unless I'm just oblivious, um, there have been multiple occasions where on the display on the side, uh -huh. um, I have seldom noted the word final being, uh, being displayed. Okay. I mean, that would appear to, to vary. Mm -hmm. Why on some occasions is final displayed and it would appear on the vast majority of cases it's not displayed? What happens, and it normally is because another member comes into the chamber and the chair affords that member the opportunity to vote. The tally clerk is in the process of closing the vote down because the chair has read 214 to 199 uh, and the bill is passed and without objection and then someone will ultimately come in the chamber and the tally clerk at that time would click the button, uh, terminate vote, set time to final, release uh, the summary boards. And in that process, it's supposed to go like this, the chair will say stop and while they're in that prop, there's no way you can take that click back because they were going through to shut the vote down. And so they're stopped by one more, one more, and affording a member the opportunity to vote. So sometimes it'll say time final, though it is, you know, the time is run out, the vote is not closed. 
Mr. Chairman, you'll know, re reclaiming my time. I'd be pleased to yield to Mr. Lothrop. I, I just want to say, having been in the chair for 12 years, my experience is it's always the same five people come into the chamber and yell one more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They will be yeah. not named. Yeah. Yeah. Yield to the gentleman from Alabama. I will be extremely brief. I want to make sure that I understand exactly the last point that was made. My understanding, and this is from recollection of sitting in the chamber, rarely does time final appear on the board. Is, it, is, is there an agreement about that, that that's a fairly rare event for time final to be displayed in the normal course of amendments and motions no, and votes? I, I, I believe, uh, and I understand your, the confusion, I believe that, and we'll, we'll clarify this, it's always displayed, but it, usually that, that five-step process is so quick that it's instantaneous. Right. Okay. Just, you don't see it. And the tally clerks, some of the tally clerks actually wait until the uh, chair gavels down the vote and then clicks through those four or five steps just simultaneously. You say some of them do that. What, what, what's the other practice? Uh, well, we, sometimes when we have uh, you know, a new tally clerk, someone who is you know, fairly new, they're not, at, they're not as fast. They're a little slower. I'm reclaiming the time to yield to Mr. Bullshaw. Five-step process. Yes. I recall, obviously, of the hundreds and hundreds of occasions with which we vote and being in the chair. Is the last step, where is the last, the point of no return? Because it's my recollection that as members, even tardy members, once the display boards go dark, you cannot retrieve that. Is, is that the last click of the button, if you will, that, that is the point of no return that you cannot retrieve that? Yes. That's after the, I, I believe it's the fifth step, which is, is it release, is confirm release of display boards, I believe is the fifth step. And, and then they're gone. But on any other of the, pre, the, the previous four steps, and perhaps we'll get to see this through our walkthrough, the tally clerk could actually go back and redo or retrace those steps if, and as you've talked about, the chair is indulgent with those tardy members. Yes. Uh, it's just that last or final step that once, I mean, that is truly the final because you cannot retrieve or bring back up that electronic board. Uh, but you can, up until that point, you can go back. And so even if, uh, it, it, and, you, you are correct. My recollection is often that word final is just briefly appearing, but it's part of the process. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, reclaiming my time, I would just uh, uh, again thank uh, the clerk uh, uh, and her team for their testimony today. It's been very illuminating. I, I do find uh, myself, Mr. Chairman, thinking your thought about a walkthrough would be helpful, uh, if not critical at some point um, as, as I've tried to look at the process here and I think about the, what's been collected and the cards uh, you know whether or not a reenactment at some point sure. would be helpful sure. um, a civil war reenactment. Um, <laughs> the uh, let me ask one further question if I may you just me Mr. Mr. Lockhart. Lockhart. one of the things just for the other members that might be instructed when you talk about a reenactment and I didn't know this until I talked to Mr. Gore but they can actually give you a computer printout of, of where everybody voted that night, what time you voted, if you stuck your card back in to confirm your vote. And, and we, we actually can reconstruct this vote and, and where people voted based upon that. And I, I think we may want to get there. Thank you, Mr. Lord. I was about to say that because we do, a lot of times we have members that will repeatedly stick their card into the, the voting stations just to check their vote. And we can tell you which voting station they um, stuck that card in, and what time? Even and we can tell you which members do, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Even when they check their vote? Yeah. Uh, re reclaiming my time, I, I, would, uh, I would alert members, Mr. Chairman, I think in a September 20 uh, communication uh, from your office, uh, I think the member-by-member -member voting station yes. information was yes. mm -hmm. uh, sent to the committee, and I might offer it to the record, uh, without, submitted to the record. Without objection. Uh, lastly, the... The whole subject of uh, these, uh, the documents that you collected in, in the immediate, and uh, 
I do find myself wanting to commend you for not waiting on Congress to inquire uh, into uh, the events that occurred on August 2nd. I commend you for taking strong leadership in your office to ascertain what occurred uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on an administrative level and preserving the documents. Where, where are uh, 18 well cards, all of that which is described in the uh, August all, letter at this they're, point? They're locked in our legislative operations office. We're on the lock and key. Okay. Um, yes, they're locked up. Everything, um, everything we have has been locked and secured because we just wanted to make sure until we received instructions from the committee uh, on how you wanted uh, to use them. Okay. We haven't tampered with them or anything. We locked them up um, with your instructions. That, that completes my question. I, I, I thank uh, the clerk and her, her team. Mr. Chairman, yield back. Stephanie. Uh, yes, thank you um, for your testimony and responses to the questions my colleagues have posed. We've explored uh, quite a bit here in terms of the broader uh, practice. Uh, of what each member of your office and the roles that they perform. And of course, there's, there's a tendency to want to kind of get at the specific mm -hmm. uh, events and procedures as how they relate to the circumstances surrounding this roll call. Mm -hmm. You had sent us a, a PowerPoint uh, presentation as well. Mm -hmm. Do you have published and updated documents or other materials for each office within your office, you, you mentioned sometimes, you know, the things get entered more slowly when you have uh, a new, new employee, new clerk coming on. So what is, I would like to see and perhaps make part of the record, anything in your office that is printed for training materials for new people uh, in each office uh, that, that go into detail and uh, that you utilize for everyone to understand the five-step process here of closing a vote. I mean, we appreciated how you set it out in a very concise way uh, in, in the PowerPoints, but I think we should make part of the record as really official standard operating procedures Procedure. from your office okay. as to the description of each person's responsibility okay. and uh, how that relates to the parliamentarian's office how that relates to the presiding officer. Are you aware of uh, those materials being available, uh, copies in the parliamentarian's office and in the speaker's office? Are they shared among all three offices involved here? I don't think so, no. And we'll certainly be taking testimony from folks from uh, the parliamentarians, because I think what's also important isn't just the, the description, the understanding of each of the four people in your office as the vote's going on, but then what's What's the understanding of the parliamentarian, especially as it relates to these tally sheets? Sure. Uh, what's the understanding of the presiding officer? I think we have uh, you know, some published materials here that help provide guidance, but whether or not everyone's on the same page uh, as to what standard operating procedure, I think is the area that we continue to need to explore here and we're laying the foundation today. Right. Right. Uh, so if we could get those materials that are available. Um, so I, th I think that that's uh, you know some of the more specific things were explored already, but um, I did want to make sure that I pose the questions of what's available in written format for new people into your office uh, and how they go about be being trained and what describes their responsibilities on the House floor during the vote. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve, I just have one uh, sort of cleanup, and that is that uh, again, in working with Mr. Gore uh, and you, Madam Clerk, you've identified. Uh, people that, that might make good fact witnesses relative to the events of August the 2nd. And in that picture, you, you've identified for us uh, Mary Kevin Nyland, who's the reading clerk on that particular evening, mm -hmm. uh, DeAndre, who's the seated tally clerk, Kevin, who's the standing, even though he's not standing in the picture. Uh, and you also indicated uh, Ed Sorensen, who's the deputy clerk. Yes. Is, is there anybody else uh, from your operation that you think would be useful for this committee to hear from relative to the facts and circumstances in the operation of the vote on August the 2nd? Or is that dead? No, sir. I, those are the folks that are most directly hands-on, um, folks that you, you really would uh, benefit from hearing from. Okay. 
Thank you very much. And then and the last thing, Mr. Chairman, I would, would, would say is that Congressman Davis had a great idea, in my opinion, during uh, some of our discussions, and that is that uh, we might want to, as we collect back witnesses, send a letter out to the membership of the House under our signatures saying any member, so that they feel included, any member, if you've got something to say about what you saw or you think you have information that would help this committee reach its conclusions, uh, I, I think I think you guys did that in the, the Medicare Part D vote, because I remember you, you sent out a letter. And I, I thought Congressman Davis, as he always does, had an excellent suggestion, and I would just ask unanimous consent if that's the appropriate thing I think that this committee do that. I think that's an excellent suggestion, and I would request that yourself and Mr. Davis draft that letter oh, sure. for, uh, <laughs> for dissemination. And, I and thought we might be volunteering ourselves. Right. <laughs> you second that. Well, that? I think that's an excellent suggestion. And let me just note that uh, I found this very uh, um, informative, illuminating, and the clerk's office might want to consider uh, having a, a similar on-the-floor uh, exposition of the process itself for the membership. Because, again, I, I can assure you that many members are ignorant of how this process works. And I know that I have uh, a number of uh, subsequent uh, questions for further clarification that I'm not going to pose at this point in time, but I think that most members would be candid and acknowledge that they're ignorant of, of this system and it could um, be very, very informative. So I, I offer that as a suggestion. Yes, sir. And, and uh, Mr. Blumenauer has um, sent, uh, sent us a letter uh, signed by several members warning uh, just such a uh, demonstration, but I, I agree with you. Uh, I sit out there sometimes and, and just having casual conversations with members about what's going on on the rostrum, and you'd be surprised at how much they don't know. Ms. Miller, I would not be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, uh, but I do want to say one parting thing. I believe emphatically that our system is sound. Our EVS system is a very good, sound system. It's been upgraded over the years. Um, we've invested quite a bit so that we can accurately, you can actually take those votes, we can tally those votes, and we can assure you that our, our system is very good. Uh, and we have a great crew of people that, that uh, maintain it. You know, I, I have no doubt about the quality of the personnel. I, I think it would be helpful to the committee if you could provide uh, the committee with um, the dates of those upgrades and, and what uh, the enhancement uh, amounted to in terms of um, the efficiency and the effectiveness of the, of, of the system. We will. Any further questions? Uh, well, uh, the chair thanks the, uh, the panel. Uh, as I indicated, uh, Ms. Miller, Mr. Gore, you've been uh, very helpful. Uh, I want to thank my, uh, my colleagues on the panel uh, for their work in, in this manner. And uh, I particularly, again, want to thank uh, Mike and Judy from CRS because uh, we would not have, uh, we wouldn't have been here today uh, with a draft report and a set of rules uh, without their invaluable assistance. And we look forward to your continued uh, help and, uh, and cooperation. Mike? Uh, I, I would just echo your uh, sentiments about uh, uh, Judy Schneider and, and uh, her team at the Congressional Research Service. We are, uh, um, without the resources, uh, at this point in the life of this uh, select committee now organized, uh, we would simply not have been able to meet our statutory obligations that we've, that we've met uh, in the business portion of this hearing. So I'm grateful to them, very grateful to the panel. And Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, after you get your daughter married off, looking very much forward to a vigorous uh, schedule of hearings and inquiries and a resolution of this issue. Thank you.
Up next on C-SPAN, a government report on U.S. border security. After that, on Washington Journal.